This episode is sponsored by Card Kingdom. Head to cardkingdom.com slash studies to pick up chaos orbs, falling stars, and all your favorite old school magic cards. Browse the graded section of the site for high-end pieces slabbed and stamped with official marks from industry leaders like PSA and CGC. This foil Shivan Dragon from 7th edition is a real heater. Whichever you choose, Card Kingdom provides high-quality products and responsive customer service, and will ship your entire order all in one package. A couple weeks back, I put out a siren's call asking for pictures and stories about Chaos Orb. Within the hour, I had a pending voicemail from a buddy out east who used to play magic way back in the day. So, me and the boys are at the store championship, and Rupert and Austin brought their buddy from out of town. Super quiet guy, he's playing this angel stasis pile, and he's crushing everybody with it. Guy makes it to the finals, and he's in game three against this horde of like 15 creatures. He's at four life, there's no chance he's coming back from this. Goes to his turn, Guy draws this single copy of Chaos Orb in his deck, and we're all looking like that. There's no chance. Like, it, it can get rid of one thing, but he's still dead on the crackback. Without skipping a beat, this guy just starts tearing up his orb into a million pieces. Like, like I said, he's quiet, dude. He hasn't said three words this entire time. So we're like, is this guy okay? Like, what's, what's going on? He just stands up, takes all the pieces and shakes them up Yahtzee style above his opponent's board and just lets him fall looks at the board and says destroy all your creatures and then we are just losing our minds at this point we're all running around screaming his opponent is just sitting there in shock a couple seconds later the opponent just calls for the judge judge comes over they step away from the table for a few seconds meanwhile we're high-fiving this guy congratulating him on the craziest win ever judge comes back looks at the guy and says you're disqualified the guy looks at the judge and says, what, is it illegal to tear up my cards? Judge looks back and says, no, but your deck only has 59 cards in it. On page 32 of the very first issue of The Duelist magazine published by Wizards of the Coast in the winter of 1994, there appears an article titled Magic Conundrums, a look at the gathering's most confusing cards. Populating the list are the usual suspects like Lich, Jade Statue, and Illusionary Mask. But there was another name too. Game designer and author of the article Dave Howell writes, Perhaps the most wildly interpreted card is Chaos Orb. He elaborates, Many players feel that when the orb is in play, anything goes. Unfortunately, there are some rules that apply to the orb's use. For one, it has to rotate 360 degrees. According to the official gatherer rules published 10 years later, this rotation is measured like a coin flipping and not like a frisbee spinning. In other words, it has to tumble side over side in the air. While it's falling, your opponent cannot physically interfere, and even before you activate the orb, they cannot rearrange the position of their cards on the table. To this, Howell remarks, There are no rules against setting up your playing area at the outset of the duel in a way that makes using the orb difficult. In the earliest days of Magic, tournament players had to consider Chaos Orb when casting spells. Often this meant spreading out lands and creatures at least one card's length apart to minimize its devastating effects on their side of the battlefield. At the first ever Magic World Championship, held at Gen Con 94 in Milwaukee, the winner of the tournament, Zach Dolan, had a Chaos Orb primed in his sideboard. Earlier that same week, Chaos Orb was restricted to one copy per deck, and by November of the following year it would be outright banned from tournament play across all formats. This remains true of the card still today. The primary reason for its outlawing is, coincidentally, its most unique feature. Chaos Orb and its distant cousin Falling Star 
have both been branded dexterity cards. They require physical skill to resolve, and since 1993, they have been sidelined exclusively to silver-bordered sets. Imitators like Orcish paratroopers require players to flip them from a height of at least one foot, but other designs like Slaying Mantis have casters tossing their cards onto the table from even further distances. Balancing is another attribute of the dexterity group. Here's a photo of my friend Jeff trying to keep a form of the approach of the second sun atop his head during an infinity draft. As per the official rule set, if you're unable to carry out such an action, you can always invite other players to perform in your place, like a celeb shot in beer pong. Reading through the notes on Scryfall for the dexterity cards is always a treat. There are some unexpectedly metaphysical comments in here. Enforcing these rules at the highest levels of tournament magic quickly became impossible. Measuring the height of one foot, and confirming the 360 degrees of rotation, and even qualifying what exactly Chaos Orb landed on in those corner case scenarios, generated too many gray areas of discrepancy. For the record, sleeves count as an extension of your cards. Also for the record, and to my great chagrin, you cannot destroy an opponent's entire library with a flip. This of course can be house ruled, as was the case at MagicCon Philadelphia when I snapped this picture. Someone's lucky day meant the opposite for someone else, but you gotta put some respect on the accuracy here. Nowadays, the only place you'll find chaos orbs flipping through the air is at your local pub in the hands of passionate cube drafters. It's a fitting environment for such a whimsical magic card, a perfect backdrop to the spectacle. Typically, players will huddle around the table when someone declares they're gonna blow up the board. A Chaos Orb activation gives us drama, suspense, a great laugh. Every snapshot tells its own story of a successful flip, or a dreadful one. I especially love being present to watch folks who have never activated the orb before. There's a lot of people who make the case for an ideal technique, but I would advocate against practicing your flips beforehand. It feels like a slight against the spirit of the card. About up to this point is what I originally had concepted for this video. I thought I'd make a shorter piece, maybe leave some room for a few anecdotes, or look at the card's surprising price trends. But while searching for stories about Chaos Orb, as it so often happens with magic history, I stumbled upon a rabbit hole that went much, much deeper. So, here I am, sitting by the computer, late at night, sleep amiss, looking through the binders. I like the binders and the cards they hold. Some people here may know that I collect Chaos Orbs. I've learned more about the history of magic trying to collect Chaos Orbs than anything else I've done within this hobby. For almost every magic player in the world, these three pieces of paper mean nothing. Finding these took me years. I could probably talk for hours about these three pieces of paper. The three Chaos Orbs that existed before Alpha went to the printers. This is the story of the first Chaos Orbs, or rather, the story of the beginning of Magic the Gathering. We often think of Alpha as the first version of Magic, a hodgepodge of ideas and incongruous concepts with egregious power level imbalances. But over a year before Alpha went to print, the game was shipped to pockets of playtest groups across the country. Accompanying these hand-printed cards were questionnaires that guided feedback for future changes. Richard Garfield understood the value of vetting and testing, and this back-and-forth correspondence with these players resulted in multiple rough drafts of his burgeoning game. The earliest Magic cards feature drawings from Calvin and Hobbes strips and old D&D manuals. Their names were in flux with their mechanics. This version of Illusionary Mask plays nothing like its printed counterpart. Cards were collated together on rudimentary sheets of printer paper and divided by rarity. Here's a batch of blue commons, which included Minor Wizard, i.e. Prodigal Sorcerer, and Time Walk. At this stage, the template for mana cost read as the total number, followed by how much must be of a certain color. This demonic tutor, for example, requires two mana, one of which must be black, and not two in a black as we might read it today. All of these examples, however, were in and of themselves polished versions of previous drafts. These aren't the alpha playtest cards. They are considered the gamma playtest cards by those who collect them, 
the near final iterations that eventually became The Gathering. Logic follows that even earlier versions of these designs exist. The paper trail follows too. To help explain, I contacted one of the foremost historians of early magic, the author of the blog that completely altered the trajectory of this video, and the inventor of the old school format, Magnus de Laval. If you try to look at you know the development of magic, you can divide it into like four kind of distinct phases. The first phase is like theory crafting, where Richard Garfield you know comes up with the ideas in his head. At this point, he removed dice from the game, or he removes the idea to tear up lost cards. And, you know, he takes the idea of mana from uh, Larry Niven's books and, you know, credits Larry Niven on that by having his name backwards on Evan Neuro's disc. And, you know, you, you have these kind of ideas. And then you come into the first stage with playtesting cards, which is commonly referred to as alpha by those who collect playtest cards. And here he has, depending on source, 80 or 120 cards that are all handmade, which he plays with Barry Reich and, you know, comes up with the ideas. And they have like one pile of cards or one deck of cards, which they split. And then, you know, comes the second phase with cards, which is, you know, more known probably, which is called beta. Here you don't really have like mana symbols, all the cards don't have arts. If a card has both like power and toughness, they only have like one digit. And they have like a hundred cards total in this set. The third playtest era, which is called Gamma, is probably the most known one. And here the cards like fully reassemble magic cards. They have both power and toughness. You know, you have instants and sorceries, you have creatures and artifacts and lands and all these kind of things. And this era starts around the autumn of 92 or something like that. At this point, they have gathered around 40 playtesters. So they have like a lot of people to playtest. It was during this primordial stage of development that Richard Garfield started thinking about magic even beyond Alpha. At this point also, you know, Richard Garfield realized that, you know, if we want to keep doing these things, he would either need to create a power creep so that people would keep buying cards, or he would need to update the games or, or create some sort of rotation so, you know, the people would be interested in, in buying new cards. So he decides to say, you know, okay, so let's try to do rotations. So instead of just having magic and then, you know, making it better and better, we will create new editions of the game each year. So the first edition we will create is Magic the Gathering. Then a year later, we'll create Magic the Ice Age. And then a year later, we'll create Magic the Menagerie. And these are not like expansions that we think of them today. These are, you know, the next edition of Magic. Collectors date the earliest known appearance of Chaos Orb to this time period. Like Prodigal Sorcerer, it went by a different name one that paid homage to a magical destructive object found in a mid-70s Dungeons & Dragons booklet. Sphere of Annihilation from the Gamma Batch marks the first of three Chaos Orb playtest cards in Magnus' collection. So the Gamma Orb, it's two to cast, nothing to activate, so it's slightly better than Chaos Orb. And also you just need to flip it from, uh, from six inches and it only needs to turn 180 degree. Uh, kind of fun fact on this that this specifies that it doesn't destroy anti. So, so that's like a very, very old school part of the card, I guess. It's hard to pin down how many of each rare of uh, Gamma was made, but they tend to say, you know, it's less than five is a very common uh, number. A lot of the rares, like a lot of the rares have never been uh, uncovered. Uh, I would like probably more than 30% of them has never been seen. So the fact that there are multiple surviving spheres of annihilation is like kind of sweet. The Gamma Sphere of Annihilation is closest mechanically to the final printed version of Chaos Orb. Garfield advocated for the dexterity cards early on. He seemed to enjoy exploring that dimension of design and gameplay. Other playtesters, however, vetoed the flip, pushing instead for an activated ability. This is evident in the second playtest card of Sphere of Annihilation, lovingly nicknamed the Orange Orb, for the unreleased edition of Magic called the Menagerie. So I, I heard about this card and I had no confirmation, but it's got to be somewhere. Yeah, but I hadn't seen a picture of it. The guy that had it was the lead playtester for Minotri. The Orange Orb was much more powerful. It cost three mana and could remove anything on the board. No flips necessary. But while Menagerie was beginning development, the Gathering released in the summer of 93 to huge demand. Given that so many cards in Menagerie were reprints or reinterpretations of cards appearing in Alpha, the team put the project on the back burner to work on expansions like Arabian Nights, Fallen Empires, and The Dark. Eventually, the designs in Menagerie were divided between Mirage and Visions, and during that time Sphere of Annihilation evolved momentarily 
into a card called Spear of Annihilation. This playtest card fully resembled a modern magic card, and in 1996, Spear evolved again and took on its final form. While Magnus was on the hunt for the orange orb, he discovered yet another hidden gem, the Epsilon Orb. Epsilon was like a really interesting set. So it was the last latest version of, of the core game of Magic before it came into fruition. The fun thing with the Epsilon one, I would argue, is that it's the first proper, you know, art failure. They accidentally used the wrong art for the card. Instead of using the art for Chaos Orb or Sphere of Annihilation, they used the art for Magical Disc or Nevenerals Disc, which is an MC Escher painting. Mechanically, the Epsilon Orb was the same as the Menagerie Orb, except it cost 4 mana instead of 3. Because of this detail, Magnus and others believe certain cards from Epsilon could simply be the second edition of Menagerie. However, an unreleased set called Power Lunch throws a wrench into certainty, as some of these cards could also have made up playtest batches for that concept. Power Lunch is another rabbit hole all its own, one that has deep roots with a separate Wizards product that released decades later in 2010. Early playtest cards from this project show off some extreme ideas, like reducing Shiv and Dragon's casting cost to two red mana. In looking at these three playtest cards side by side, we catch a glimpse of the push and pull tension between creator and playtester. We see how the decisions made in the earliest days of development would affect how we conceive of magic for decades to come. This like early era, especially if you look at Menagerie and Ice Age, maybe especially Menagerie, these cards are created before Alpha comes to the printer. And these guys have different ideas of what magic should be like from like a ludo narrative perspective. Richard is a fan of, you know, like the physical attributes of the cards that you can like throw the cards and, and do these kind of things. And, and Joel Mix seems to be not as interested in this. So, so when he creates the Chaos Orb for his set, you don't throw it. It just, you know, indicates something. So, so you have this, like, you can see the different ideas of how you want to approach magic and what you want to do with it. And because like Richard Garfield had, you know, the by far the biggest hat in the start, like you create some cards to throw around. When Magnus started collecting Chaos Orbs for the revered global set, he thought that these three playtest cards would serve as fancy flourishes, accents to the complete base, a finishing touch of fine jewelry. Instead, they opened up yet further rabbit holes. In 1952, a tiny family-owned business outside of Los Angeles, California entered the consumer market specializing in the production of photo albums to preserve family memories. In 1988, with baseball cards on the rise, the same company resized and repurposed their trademark polypropylene sheets to protect collectibles from aging. In 1995, as trading card games exploded in popularity in the wake of Magic's success, the company proposed another simple idea. What if we reduced the nine-pocket plastic page to the size of a single card? Introducing Ultra Pro and Magic, a winning combination. From the outset, players were antagonistic to card sleeves. They were banned in tournaments in parts because they obscured the logo on the card back, and culturally speaking, there was far less emphasis on preserving what many considered to be just game pieces. In the Duelist issue number three, Wizards of the Coast sent a survey out to readers to engage their sentiment on sleeves, marking the beginning of a paradigm shift toward protecting cards while playing. Knowing they were facing tough odds, Ultra Pro decided the best way to sell sleeves to unconvinced players would be to entice them with a treasure hunt. So in 1996, they kicked off a contest called the Black Lotus Quest. The first Magic Sleeves, they had this promotion, Ultra Pro, that said, you know, if you find like all the nine pieces of the Chaos Orb and put them in like an Ultra Pro binder and send them into Ultra Pro, you will get $100. So you can go and buy yourself a Beta Chaos Orb. Or if you find all the Black Lotus pieces, you get $250. So you can go and buy yourself, you know, a Beta Lotus. In order to keep people opening packs of sleeves, they took a page from the booster playbook and stacked the deck. Eight of the nine pieces were fairly common for both puzzles, but slot 9 on Black Lotus and slot 7 on Chaos Orb were extremely rare. Magnus likens the campaign to another renowned consumer-oriented lottery. 
To date, the total number of completed Chaos Orb puzzles in circulation is estimated to be fewer than 10, and one of them belonged to him. I've managed to get into contact with the people at Ultra Pro who ran the promotion and you know, tried to you know, get some follow-up with them. It's hard to know, like, they don't know exactly how many they made. They don't have the date on that, but they said there were, you know, a good handful of people that, that sent them in and, you know, they got the money. My personal current opinion, which can be proven wrong, is that they made 12 pieces of uh, the Chaos Orb, around 12, and around six of the Black Lotus. This contest stands out to me for two reasons. For one, it marks the beginning of Magic outgrowing its position as a fringe game and becoming an independent industry, with companies like UltraPro following in suits and developing hyper-specific products to satisfy niche demands. Secondly, it comes as no surprise that marketing teams leveraged the iconicity of Black Lotus to drive sales, but Chaos Orb was right there too. Early magic was, in part, defined by this image, which reflected the sensibilities of its younger player base. When you're a tween in the mid-90s, is it cooler to have, you know, this flower that can help, you know, cast a turn one giant spider? Or is it cooler to have this, like, amazing sphere of annihilation that they throw on your opponent to annihilate this entire board? I mean, the, the answer is, like, kind of easy, I would say. Slowly but surely, Magnus's eclectic collection was coming together. Then, in the midst of the tumultuous year that was 2020, yet another extremely strange oddity crossed his path, a keepsake that was tailor-made for such a passionate and particular collector such as himself. This is a heavily loved Alpha Chaos Orb, with text altered by the one and only Richard Garfield. Yeah, so the Garfield altars are really cool, I think. The, the idea is that, you know, there was this schoolyard urban legend where I was a kid that says that, you know, you could, uh, if you had a card that Richard Garfield had edited the text on and then signed, you could play it as written. Because that's kind of what they did during playtesting. Uh, he said, okay, yeah, maybe this time walk needs to, you know, sacrifice an island also. And then just write that on the card and sign it, and then it suddenly has a slightly different effect. So, so because that's how they try to play the game. So. If you found old cars with Garfield's, especially his old signature, you would say that, yeah, these can be played as written. So we had these stories of, you know, there is this ancestor recall that draws 10 cards or this birds of paradise that can deal damage. The first of these Garfield altered chaos orbs that Magnus found back in 2016 was a copy from Unlimited. Then I, uh, per chance, found this Chaos Orb uh, from Unlimited that, you know, said when you flip it, you rip up the card of it, and you rip up the Chaos Orb as well. Of course, finding this card created desire for an entirely new sub-collection within the collection. And then I knew about a beta version also of Chaos Orb that had the, the altar. This one spoke directly to Richard Garfield's sensibilities. It was modified to require players to drop the orb from 10 feet without flipping it, and upon resolution, it would transfer control to a target player. Eventually, I, I figured out that there existed a, an alpha version also. So there was one unlimited one beta and one alpha, and I was like, Jesus, I need to really get hands on this alpha version. As fate might have it, Magnus happened upon such a card while playing at an old school tournament in a rundown pub. At that point, I had like almost as a yoke started a format that, you know, was alpha only. So I only played with alpha cards. Chaos Orb is played exactly as written. People spread out the cards. I went to a tournament with, you know, a whiteboard and magnets to avoid Chaos Orb so I can put the cards on like a magnet on the side of the wall. And there came like 50 people. And then the next year, we were over 100 people, you know, playing with only alpha cards in a dank pub. And this guy comes and he has, you know, he's got his Chaos Orb, that's the, the alpha version uh, of the Garfield Altar. It's like extremely well played, edited to be, you know, experienced Chaos Orb. Uh, and it costs five to cast and two to activate, but you get to flip it twice. Within a couple of years, the original owner decided to sell the beat up alpha orb to Magnus, thus completing the holy grail of Garfield Altars in a now robust collection. Other rarities in the binder included a couple of artist proofs from Mark Tadine, some very goofy Chaos Orb reskins from Inquest issue number 61, which included a proxy called Order Orb that returned cards from your graveyard back to your hands, and a custom altar by Lady Death Touch painted on a battering ram. Renaming this one Sphere of Annihilation was a cool touch. Perhaps the most endearing of Magnus's orbs was sent to him as a gift from a dear friend in Italy. My personal favorite of the Chaos Orb, especially the gifts, was one that I got from a good friend in Italy. 
the story here is that you know the first world champion of magic, Zach Dolan, he played Chaos Orb in a stick. At some point, you know, Zach Dolan decided to sell his cards, but he didn't sell his Chaos Orb because his deck was found by his dog, and his dog shooed on his deck. So his Chaos Orb has been like fully shooed by a dog and like kind of missing a corner, and it's like very strange shape. So I got this Chaos Orb that has a personal letter from Zach Dolan. It's like, yeah, so this is my old Chaos Orb. I had it for over 20 years. It was shooed by a dog, so I didn't sell it. I know. <laughs> In the summer of 2022, Magnus and his wife learns they would be expecting their second child, a daughter. The binder containing all the Chaos Orbs suddenly took on a different shape, and by the end of the year, it would no longer be his to maintain. In the process of searching for a potential buyer, Magnus found the ideal caretaker, someone who was there at the very beginning of magic, someone that had a distant hand in Chaos Orbs' design. Magnus flew from Oslo to San Diego to hand-deliver the binder himself, then spent the weekend playing cards with Joel Mick, one of the alpha playtesters, and the newest custodian of the Chaos Orb collection. So, so one thing that's cool if you look at Chaos Orb and the history of Chaos Orb, you could follow it in like in three kind of different ways. One is that it was, you know, the card design as itself, like a kind of quirky card. So you can see like how the different playtesters approach it. So you have this, you know, design approach, like what we want to do with magic, do we want the cards to have their own physical properties? But then you also have the power level of the card in the sense that, you know, it affects tournament play and you can follow ideas of tournament magic and, and, and competition and, you know, power cards and, and the banner restricted list that, you know, the tournament scene very well with it. You also have, you know, the general design and art of the card, which was very iconic. So when you created something in magic, at least, you know, in the first five years of the game, what you tended to do as promotional material was, you know, Chaos or Black Lotus or both. There is also a fourth thread that you can follow with Chaos Orb, one of urban legends and myth. You can trace a history of rumors, of a friend of a friend who ripped up their card and tossed it like dice, or of a guy who showed up to the pub with a whiteboard and magnets as a playmat to dodge flips, or of a mysterious playtest card that was lost to time. Every magic card tells a story, but Chaos Orb is a story. Intrinsic to its design is the prerequisite of sitting across the table from another person and playing cards together. The anecdotes that emerge from these encounters don't need to be true, they just need to be good. And we must continue telling them. We must continue to skylark, and we must continue to jest. The Chicago Old School Magic Club Lords of the Pit have a standing contest at their events. Hit 50 Chaos Orb flips in a row, and earn your patch. Long live the orb. The final sponsor for this episode is the Frame-A-Majigs Kickstarter project. Frame-A-Majigs are the framing solution for your collectible cards. Each frame has a solid wood construction with no moving parts and includes a magnetic case with UV protection to showcase the crowns of your collection. Cards easily slot in and out at the top of the frame so you can quickly mix and match them, and each case is compatible with Pokemon, Magic, and most collectible sports and comic cards. These frames are available in black and wood to start, with more colors unlocking based on stretch goals. Use my affiliate link below to support the Kickstarter. We're in the home stretch now, so pick up some frames before time runs out. In the mid-2000s, Magnus and a few of his Swedish friends conceived of a format that captured the essence of the earliest days of the game. They named this format Old School 9394, and as the name suggests, deck building was constrained to cards printed within the first two years of design. I, I think like one of the core ideas was that, you know, I, I really wanted to go to a convention where people could go like zero two and still stay, or, you know, the uh, putting the gathering back in Magic in, in a good way, because when I played like in the mid 2000s, where I played at least, it was a bit more competitive. And that side of Magic can be funneled, so I don't mind going to a tournament where my goal is to win. But having this idea that, you know, you could try to find that, you know, old nostalgia in a sense, and, you know, uh, 
be a bit more creative with your decks in a sense because you had to because when you, when you play cards that are only printed in the first year of magic like always 93 to always 94 alpha through the dark you you can't build the best deck you need to kind of commit to suboptimal builds in a sense and i think chaos will fit like perfect in that form because it is like this whimsical kind of card right so the old school magic format came you know from a place of hanging out with people and i was very lucky and pleasantly surprised to see that you know there were a lot of people you know with the same sentiment as me around the world for balancing purposes magnus instated a slight rules change to chaos orb you still flip it of course but it can only destroy one target permanent in this way the card now rewards marksmen with excellent targeting skills while preserving the core design of the card the landing page of veteran magic artist Mark Tadeen's website features Chaos Orb. In 2013, Tadeen reimagined the orb for an art book collection called The Gathering to celebrate Magic's 20th anniversary. More recently, Tadeen held a painting demonstration for an old school charity tournament in California. Under his tutelage, players painted their own versions of the icon, with Mark donating his completed painting to be sold for charity. Rumors have it that he flipped an orb while he was there too. In 2021, Chaos Orb's legacy came full circle with the printing of Sphere of Annihilation for Adventures in the Forgotten Realms, Magic's D&D-inspired expansion. Sadly, this one bears no mention of flips, but the real ones don't forget where they came from. Once again, long live the orb. Special thanks to Magnus de Laval, the godfather of old school magic, for helping with this story. His blog is a must-read for magic enthusiasts, he's written over a million words on magic in the past 10 years, and the research he does for his posts is inspiring. I have links to recommended readings in the description below. Thanks so much for watching.